Let me say that uh, it is always a, a pleasure to come to Washington, Washington DC, uh, more so from the, the din and bustle of New York. And, um, but Washington has a special meaning for me. Uh, I came here in June 1972 <coughs> to open the first Bangladesh Embassy here. Wow. Many years ago. Many of you were not even born <laughs> at that time. Um, and that was the first diplomatic assignment that I had of an independent country called Bangladesh. Um, my wife, who is also here, uh, for both of us it has also a special meaning. Our youngest child was born here. Um, and so we, are, uh, we have very fond memories of this <coughs> city. <coughs> um, and we always welcome any opportunity to come here. But um, as we were coming over to DC in the train, I felt very highly spirited um, for two reasons. First, of course, I was having a very strong feeling of the winds of change that is coming to this capital city of the the sole superpower and uh, it encouraged me tremendously. It made me very happy that we can expect uh, a true role by a real superpower um, uh, who would be compassionate, who would be supportive, who would take care of the weakest of the weak in the international community. The second reason I felt was uh, the felt so high spirited was the purpose for which I am coming here. I am coming here to open the another a new centre for culture of peace, um, uh, and uh, I am particularly honoured that I have been invited uh, to to do this opening. Uh, I am. Mm, also particularly privileged that I had been associated with uh, opening of all the culture of peace resource centers uh, in the United States and for which I'm, I'm deeply honored and deep, deeply grateful. Um, and I also see that a uh, number of my friends and colleagues from um, uh, the diplomatic community are here. Uh, countries which are, uh, which had been, uh, till very recently, my focus of attention. Uh, and as uh, I was being introduced, you heard about the least developed countries, the landlocked developing countries, the small island developing states. I feel very attached to these countries. I feel a part of them, and it was an honor and privilege for me to be an advocate for these countries. For five years, I was the first incumbent in that position, and uh, I had a tremendous challenge to speak up for the uh, countries whom I call the voiceless countries of the world. Numerically, there are many, but they really have no voice at the United Nations. And so, to speak up for these countries, to put their concerns high on the global agenda was a really a challenging task, but I was deeply honored and I'm very happy to say that at least some start was made uh, with uh, the creation of that office. I would like to pay a special tribute to the Sotaraka International for taking up the cause of cultural peace in a real earnest way. And I believe that what you have done, you and your members, SGI and its members, world over. I went to many places where I had interacted with you. I believe that um, this is a, a wonderful mission that you have made as part of your um, regular activities. 
uh, I feel each one of the members is wonderfully charged, fired up to speak up for culture of peace. And I believe that that's a wonderful contribution to the global movement for a culture of peace. This center that we are opening today would be um, really uh, a, a key and um, would have really a key role in advancing the, the, the movement for culture of peace. And um, as uh, Paula mentioned that the lecture series that the resource centers have started, and I'm sure Washington DC Center will also uh, start their own soon and will add up to the tremendously rich uh, contribution that we get from diverse backgrounds and diverse people uh, in, in articulating the, the uh, role a culture of peace can play in creating a better world, a better um, uh, situation for uh, humanity. So I am I'm absolutely delighted and uh, I feel humbled by the thought that um, this initiative for a global movement start with a simple letter in on 31st of July in 1997 when I wrote as ambassador of Bangladesh to the, to the then Secretary General of the United Nations Kofi Annan asking that the United Nations should put culture of peace as a separate item of agenda in the plenary meetings of the United Nations General Assembly. The subject was discussed as a sub-sub-sub-subject of other <laughs> items. But I said, this item is so important and this is so necessary that it should be put as a separate item of agenda. And that sort of snowballed into a big, big uh, sort of initiative now. Now worldwide, uh, uh, the, the movement for culture of peace has been picked up by individuals because the individual is at the center of this movement for culture of peace. It is in each one of us that a big powerhouse exists which can advance the, the cause of culture of peace. Because unless we change ourselves, no change is possible outside. We need to, to understand that we cannot ask for a global peace and and the peace everywhere unless we change ourselves into uh, into um, an agent of peace. So that that is what I believe had started and the last three years of the last millennium if I may say or the last decade uh, were wonderful in terms of advancing the cause of peace in, in terms of philosophical dimension. The 1997, the UN decided to declare the year 2000 that is, as International Year of Culture of Peace. In 1998, it decided to declare the decade that you mentioned here for, uh, for, for, for the years from 2001 to 2010. And then in 1999, with a program of action on culture of peace. And it identified eight specific areas. And as you have this booklet, uh, as you move, uh, get out of this room um, in your package, please do read it. You may be very busy, so whenever you spend time going by bus or subway or waiting for somebody, just open the booklet and read a few paragraphs. You will feel tremendously encouraged. It's I. Uh, as Joe mentioned, I chaired the nine-month-long work, you know, in anything of that nature to get an agreement in the United Nations from 189 at that time, now 192 countries, um, uh, was a major task. But even when I read that document, I find that there's so much of richness in each paragraph. Um, so that is what was done in 99. So all these work is there all these uh, all these unpolished gems if i may call them are there but they are lying there without really 
um, uh, uh, showing their brightness because we have not picked up the challenge. When I say we, I mean basically the member states of the United Nations or the United Nations Secretariat led by the Secretary General. They have not picked up the challenge of promoting a culture of peace. If you really think of the global situation at this point of time, you will realize how valuable this initiative is and how worthwhile it can be um, if we really want the world to be peaceful in a sustainable way. It is not that I stop a conflict there and we achieve peace. We have to realize that peace is not just absence of war. Peace is much more comprehensive than that, much more inclusive than that. It has to contribute not only to our individuals' lives, but to the communities, to the society's life. It has to be sustainable in the, in the most, most importantly, it has to be sustainable in a longer term way. So that is why I mentioned that um, all the billions of dollars that we spend in peacekeeping operations of the United Nations, one-tenth of that cost, if spent on building a culture of peace in our societies, I believe that these conflicts would not have recurred again and again. And that is what is happening. The moment there is a difficult peacekeeping operations, we talk about increasing the number of troops. We do not talk, talk about or think about how to make the people of that region, of that country, understand the value of peace. And there I must say that the involvement of young people and women are absolutely essential. Young people I say because they are at a point of their life when they are about to take responsibilities in their societies. And I think I have met hundreds of thousands of young people worldwide speaking to them. And I find them very open, very eager to reach out to the rest of the world. They are aware of the, they are, they are respectful of the diversity of the world. They are respectful of the the differences that exist in this world, but they believe in the oneness of the world. They believe that we are in a global village. If, if one part of the village is affected, the rest cannot remain immune from that. So I have wonderful hopes about them. So if they can um, uh, build in themselves the spirit of culture of peace, I believe that in, in few years' time, the world will be a much better place. But then I also worry um, that these young people in their universities, in their colleges are very enthusiastic about it. But what happens when they enter their professional life? Suddenly, they become very narrowly focused. They become antagonistic or at least indifferent to each other. Why this change take place? Why the spirit of culture of peace which they, they build among themselves cannot continue for the rest of their life. So that's my message. And I just before coming here, I had um, a dialogue with young people. And that is what I was telling them, that make peace a part of your existence. It does not have to be a grand scheme to be an advocate for culture of peace. It can be very simple in your day-to-day -day life. How you can enhance your goals in life through peaceful, non-violent means. How you can interact with each other in a peaceful, non-violent way. That's very important. And that can be done through simple things. So that, that is very important. The other part of the society that I'm thinking of are the tremendously important role that women are playing in promoting a culture of peace, in making peace sustainable. Because we have seen many of the countries that I used to sort of be responsible for are either going into conflict or coming out of conflict or 
or are presently in conflict situations. And I find that in those societies, women are the real sort of cementing factor. They are keeping these societies together, which is being torn apart by conflict. And I believe that it is very important to give women the role that they deserve to play. They have the broader interest of the society in mind. They want to continue efforts which will make peace sustainable in their countries where their children and grandchildren can have better opportunities than they themselves had. So it is <coughs> very important that their role is recognized. We have seen that uh, in most cases, and uh, President Nelson Mandela came to the Security Council <coughs> once to brief us on the Burund Burundi peace process. And he was telling that in the evening he would meet with the, the women leaders and they would share many ideas with him and say, in the morning I tried those. Those started working. And then I insisted that women should be brought to the peace table. And he said, when they joined us, enormous changes started taking place because they had such ideas and thoughts without any sort of <coughs> efforts in sharing power because men had, were always joking that in the, out of the, in the outcome of the peace negotiations, where their position would be, what they will benefit from, whether there will be a cabinet post for them or there will be some uh, sort of power sharing with them. So, <coughs> excuse me. So they were absolutely um, uh, uh, sort of unhappy with this involvement of women in, in the peace table. And this had been uh, uh, our effort in the United Nations and my effort in personally because in, in, 19, in 2000, um, um, uh, I had initiated a move which resulted in a Security Council resolution recognize this thing, recognizing this role of women in the peace table. And I believe that this is something which we need to, even in advancing the cause of cultural peace, even in the work of the SGI, the women members have done wonderfully well. I think they are way ahead of the international community in promoting a culture of peace. So I believe the young people, women, need to be engaged in, in a big way. But this is a movement for all of us. This is a movement where, uh, coincidentally, maybe more appropriately, civil society is playing a bigger role than the member states. It is civil society which is carrying the flag of culture of peace um, and keeping the, the, the flame of culture of peace burning. Uh, and uh, sometimes I I get frustrated when I find that the member states are not enthusiastic enough uh, in promoting culture of peace. But um, uh, occasionally I believe that, uh, and I, I am believing it more and more, that it is better that it is coming from the grassroots. It is better that it is coming from civil society. Because that way it will have a stronger root among the people. The governments come and go, governments change, and focus may change with each change of the government. So it's better that it stays with the people, with the common people, and it will be more permanent. So I am in that sense much more happy these days. And let me finish by saying that uh, as the, the decade for cultural peace is coming to an end in 2010, we have about maybe two years left. Um, this initiative was taken by me at the request of the Nobel Peace Laureates. They wrote me a letter saying that we have this idea for a decade, would you be willing to pick, pick up the, the, the initiative uh, to introduce it in the United Nations. Uh, as um, I had initiated the International Year of Peace the earlier year, and I think they thought that it is good to approach me. And it is coming to an end without really much happening, particularly on the part of the 
the government. So we are thinking of two things to to uh, to do. One is to create a, a global sort of um, uh, index to see how countries, how United Nations, how member states are implementing in their countries this program of action on cultural peace. How how they are doing and uh, to judge. Uh, how much they have taken up in uh, uh, in incorporating these thoughts in in their countries. The second is to convene a global meeting, maybe of the Nobel Peace Laureates, all the living Nobel Peace Laureates, to bring them together, to to tell to ask them that you had given us this idea about the international decade for cultural peace. The decade is coming to an end in 2010. What are your inspiration for the coming decade or the coming decades? What we should do, what the international community should do? And this, this is my hope, this is my dream and this is my expectation that we'll be able to convene such a gathering in 2010 to get energized for the next decade. And I would uh, like, uh, I, I decided to share that thought. It is still in an uh, uh, incubation stage and we are thinking of that, that it will be wonderful to do so. It will be also uh, wonderful to create a network of uh, uh, global organizations and individuals who are working on culture of peace. Wherever I go, I find that small communities, small organizations are working very dedicated, in a very de dedicated way to promote a culture of peace in their communities. And I, I feel that uh, if, when, whenever I talk to them, they say, we are very small, we, we have no power. Uh, I say, but don't feel bad. There are thousands of organizations like yours working worldwide. And then I started feeling that if these organizations could be connected with each other yes. through mm -hmm. new technologies, through, through internet, through, through websites, they will feel very empowered. Mm -hmm. They will feel stronger that I am not alone. I have thousand other similar small bodies working all over the world to promote culture of peace. And I, I think that is also another um, uh, sort of plan that I have in mind, in mind. And I wanted to share that. Let me conclude by saying that um, While we work for culture of peace, one important thing should be kept in mind that peace and development are very closely connected. They are, in a way, two sides of the same coin. That peace, neither peace nor development can be achieved without the other. And you have seen that in many parts of the world, the major cause of conflict is poverty. Poverty. And poverty, I say, not only of economic, in an economic sense, but poverty of opportunity is what causes conflict. And that is what is important to keep in mind that peace and development go together and needs to be addressed together. So as we work for culture of peace, we should remember the importance of uh, uh, development in each of our communities. And Finally, to say that in last few years, unfortunately, religion is seen as a divisive thing in our societies. But I very strongly believe that religion can play a tremendously important role in promoting a culture of peace. And by religion, I mean the spirituality of the religion. The spiritual dimension in each one of us needs to be enhanced to really achieve the objectives of cultural peace. So it's very important and in that context I think the, the interfaith efforts, the dialogue that we have amongst religions, the, the efforts that uh, are being uh, enhanced by organizations like SGI I believe are very important and so I believe that without spirituality uh, the 
21st century would not be able to stand out as a century of achievement, a century of peace, and a century of global progress. Thank you.